Hey, welcome everyone to another edition of Unravel Your Mind. We're here to transform relationships, love, and life. I encourage everyone to submit questions. Um, anything that may be running around into your brain, maybe you're hearing other people ask, or just questions for the collective. Uh, things that you feel like need to be solved or you just want some guidance on, um, please always submit them. I do my very best to cover them all. You can, if you're listening live, you can enter them in the chat below. Even if you're listening on replay, I always check the chats and can incorporate them into next week's show if you're not with me live. So I'm excited this week. We've got some really great questions coming in and uh, it's a foggy, cloudy, weird day here. It's like we're walking through clouds. It's really interesting. And I, I, I like to think that it's cloud nine. So um, let's jump right in. So question number one, what do you think woke means? Don't you think it's been misunderstood lately? Actually, yeah, you know, that word woke never resonated for me for some reason. I know a lot of people were using it and they were using it in the context um, in the spiritual community as someone who is awakened, someone who has, you know, really stepped into their spiritual journey and more into their ascension journey. And so that was my impression of the original meaning of it, or at least how I was exposed to it in the context of which I heard it. Now, what I find so interesting is that recently in the last, I don't even know, six months to a year, it seems like it's entered um, a really interesting political landscape. And I don't mean the traditional politics, although it probably is there too. Um, people are using it in the sense of, uh, wanting to say that people are a little too woo-woo, a little crazy, um, you know, but what it ultimately comes down to is that people who are not expanding their consciousness, the people who are not actually um, transforming themselves and their relationships to love and life are in very narrow lanes. And those narrow lanes are thinking that, a variety of things. It could be that they don't believe that you should have same-sex marriages. It could be that they don't believe that you should be Muslim. It could be all of these different crazy ideas that that people don't want to allow themselves to unravel and accept because they want to remain separate and they want to remain in their own communities, their own thought process, um, so that they can feel comfortable with who they think they are. And look, if they really knew who they really were, um, they'd be bundles of love, accepting and loving everyone. But not everybody's there yet. And a lot of people are trying. And then there's a lot that aren't. So I would say like if people are given the word woke a hard time, it's probably the ones that really aren't trying <laughs> to expand their consciousness in any way or to transform their life. So that would be what how I would answer that one. I think the word woke is let's just leave it off the table. Um, I don't think it, it we need to argue about it or fight about it. And I'm not suggesting the person that submitted the question is, I'm just saying like, let's just let it go. Let's just keep shining the light and expanding our own consciousness and, and not getting caught up in how people want to pigeonhole or put people into certain categories. It's just unnecessary. All right, let's go to question number two. How can I keep shifting my thoughts to keep me moving forward when I constantly feel like I'm slipping backward? Yeah, it's a tricky one. I think a lot of us are going through some interesting times right now where there's so much happening in the collective. And so the minute that that we're um, really in that, that energy, that pocket, um, weird analogy, but this is what's coming to me. If you've ever been swimming in the ocean and you're swimming and there's warm water, and then all of a sudden there's like this really cold current that comes in. It feels like that's sort of what's happening. And you know how a fish doesn't necessarily know that it's in water um, because it's just surrounded by it. I feel like that's what's happening for us is that we're all surrounded by all of these different energies. Some of us have more uh, astute awareness of them, more keen awareness of, of how those energies are working. And then at times, Times, it's just too overwhelming to really be able to tune into all those energies every moment of every day. So, so all of that happening, I think is what's happening with your thoughts. So you're shifting your thoughts into a positive way. You're expanding your thoughts. You're, you're thinking positive. You're seeing the big picture. You know, you're bringing your vision down into this dimension as to what you think you're here to do, um, how you're here to contribute to humanity. And yet 
you get those cold currents of water that just rush in and you're like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. So I think it's just allowing those cold currents like you would in the ocean to just come through and go, oh, wow, that that felt a little spooky or that felt a little weird to kind of have that unexpected blast. Um, and that's the blast of thoughts that I think a lot of us are getting too because they're all swirling and people are releasing at different times and we're impacted. If you're an empath, you're someone who feels other people's emotions knowingly or unknowingly, you're going to feel a lot of these weird bouts of doubt. Um, the shadow of the doubt is the one that's always going to get us. Um, and we want to just keep shining the light on any of these thought forms that are from a lower vibration. Doesn't mean that they're bad. It just means that they're not from our higher self, that it's our mind questioning ourselves, questioning, you know, how we think this world works. And right now we're at a time where we're breaking through all of these heavy, heavy thought constructs. So every time you break through, then you're going to get tested and everyone around you in most cases is going to, you know, test you as well, because that's really where we're able to, to, to see ourselves um, really ascend and not be caught up in all the minutia of this third dimensional reality. So we want to be in this world. We just don't need to be of it. We don't need to be in the lower vibration of it. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. I think it's normal right now for a lot of this to be happening. Um, but it's also part of the, the ground where we are building that spiritual muscle. We're building that spiritual toolbox to be able to not allow these currents to impact us. We acknowledge them. Oop, felt cold on my leg in the ocean, but ah, okay, it's, it's past. And, uh, and really just staying solid in your knowingness and your connection to source energy is what is going to always get you through. So always going to be bumps on the road. All right, let's go to the next question. Question number three, what do you think it means to be in your sacred feminine? I'm a strong woman mentally and spiritually. I find it challenging to balance my energies in relationship with men. I feel like I have to flex and communicate with them in their language. Well, this I think is actually a really loaded question. There's lots of things I, I feel compelled to, to talk about here. Um, the sacred feminine, first of all, is a place where you really are able to be in a receiving mode. And I think when you're in your sacred feminine, you also want to be in your sacred masculine, right? We don't want to be out of balance with one or the other. And the word sacred simply to me means that you're transcending um, the ideas about men and women and genitalia, right? This is not about like what what kind of physical body do I have? This is about really being in that sacred feminine masculine energy. Now, if you have chosen to come in as a female in a female body, or you've chosen to come in um, in a different body type, but you associate more with a female type energy, it's still important that we have a balance in these in these energies and the sacredness of it again, it means that we're not caught up in these ideations about what being a man and a woman and what feminine and masculine energy need to be. It's about finding that beautiful balance and then finding another that wants to share it with you, irregardless of what their body type is or their, their gender preference. Um, I know that for some, that's maybe a little bit much and everyone has their own lane that they want to stay in when it comes to uh, what's acceptable or not. But in in oneness and in, in unconditional love, there isn't this judgment about, about how we really come into this world and, and represent ourselves. Everything is just a, a construct of this social structure that helps people to navigate and think that they know, again, who they are when in most cases they're going to find out that that's not who they really are. And it's not for every everyone. It takes lifetimes oftentimes for people to really be able to pop through and understand some of these concepts. So if you're not ready for it yet, that's fine too. If you want to, you know, have a different view, um, we, we welcome that as well. Um, okay. So next, oh, so the next part of that question, I want to continue on. So I'm a strong woman mentally and spiritually. I find it challenging to balance my energies in relationship with men. So I think there's, again, sort of two things here. It's like balancing your relationship with men in romance 
or balancing relationship with men in business. Um, they can have a slightly different tweet to them. I think that, um, you know, in the end, it really is just the same, but there is something about how we, we work with people that might be a little bit different than how we are in a romantic relationship. Um, romantic relationships, you know, there's a big illusion around romantic love and, and how people are here to, uh, to be in relationship with us. And so it's really about finding, you know, where is it that, that you want to be in that relationship energetically with that individual? Again, ideally that you have really mastered your, your own masculine feminine energy. But a lot of times as a woman, I want to be in my feminine. I want to be in a relationship for me. My preference is to have a man who is in their masculine and yet that we can both balance that. So he can still be very much in his heart and feeling and receiving center, um, you know, from me, but that he can also be in the masculine and, and be, you know, that real stake in the ground and, and that energy of, of protection and guidance, um, and when that happens, then the masculine really can be uh, the stake in the ground in the relationship from the standpoint of letting letting the feminine dance, letting the feminine bring all the energy of creativity and beauty into the relationship. So I think that for, for romantic relationships, um, as I said, it doesn't have to be different, but I think that it has a slightly different nuance because there is an intimacy element and, and a soul sharing element that is really helpful when we can we can really find that beautiful balance with our partners um, and be in that intimate uh, erotic flow. So that's different than when you're working with someone in a business setting, of course. Um, one of the things that I find really interesting is I think when women came into the marketplace uh, and really came to be in business, um, which didn't happen that long ago, they were really trying to be like a man, like let's play their game. And if we were to rewind it all over again, which we can't, but we can start out now and bring our really strong feminine energy without the sexual undertones, without the manipulation of using our sexuality and sensuality, but that we use as a woman in our, in our feminine, that really powerful creative energy and that really powerful speaking our truth energy that we can do, then I think we have this opportunity to change business dramatically. And not because we're a woman, but because we've chosen to really channel through as a female, our feminine energy, and that we're projecting that out in a very positive way to our masculine male parts so that we can start shifting the dynamic within business. And if you're not able to do that in the position that you're in, I think you should consider looking at another, another company, another position, another profession, because there's no time than, than the present, the now to be in your, in your real sacred space and in that place where, where you're contributing and being seen for it. So if you're not, and everyone else is still in some old social construct about, you know, masculine dominance, then if you're bringing everything you can to the table and you're feeling like you're being, you know, really, really beat down and sucked out, then there's no reason for you to stay in that environment. We don't have to keep going um, and swimming uphill. Um, of course, there's tenacity and we want to hold our stake and we want to be able to to continue on, but we don't need to do it at, at our own cost, our own emotional, mental, physical well-being cost. So only you know that balance. Only you know what's happening for you in your particular situation. But it is something to really, really bring to light is how am I using, if you're a woman or if you identify with being a woman, how am I using my feminine energy and hopefully you're in that sacred feminine energy where you're really able to be balancing masculine and feminine how am i bringing it forward how am i utilizing it for the good and graciousness of humanity all right let's go on to the next question um the next question is number four how do i step out of making it happen and step into allowing it to happen I have run my life with inspired action, but I don't feel very inspired these days. I feel quite weary. Um, I think that, you know, 
well, quite some time ago, I felt like, oh my gosh, I am so good at manifesting when I was really like at the more beginning part of my spiritual journey. And it was like, oh, everything was just showing up. And, you know, I was like putting it out there and the universe was bringing it to me. And and then it came a time where I felt like, gosh, my manifestation wand is, must be broken or something because it just felt like things weren't weren't happening as as quickly. And I think part of it was I started to get used to this, this fast manifestation. But I think that... Um, that what happens is that that there's an element of ourselves that needs to sort of catch up with um, our bigger vision and plan. And sometimes we take these big leaps forward in our plan because we have a soul plan. And then there's sort of what feels like or can feel like a lag time in between this and the next thing. And that's where spirit's always going to come back and say, you got to enjoy the moment of now. And sometimes those moments of now are very quiet periods of time. So if you're someone picking up the energy that you might be someone who likes to have things always happening and go, 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 and do, 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 um, and experience, experience, um, this is a time to just slow down. This is a time to just really sit in the beauty and the bliss. This is the time to go out and observe a flower. This is the time to see a butterfly and observe its beauty. This is the time to, you know, drink our matcha tea and just really feel uh, the taste that we that we like, that feel the texture of uh, of it, and experience things from another more sensitized level. Otherwise, what happens? The mind takes over, and when the mind takes over, it says, "Ah, this isn't exciting. I'm just here drinking a, you know, a cup of matcha." Well. Then, then you start to get into this disparity issue, right? Because the mind wants to bring in what isn't here and what you should be doing or shouldn't be doing or, you know, all that judgment comes in from the mind. And that's where we've got to get back, ooh, ee, you know, back up, stop it and, and really go, wait, I'm enjoying this moment of now. I don't need to have something more in this moment for me to be happy. So, um, let me go back to the question, make sure that I've covered this one. Um, yeah. So how do I uh, step out of making it happen and step into allowing it to happen? Um, so I feel like I digress slightly there, but there was some good nuggets that came through and, you know, stepping in to allow it to happen is being in those quiet moments, right? It's, it's not thinking that there's something you need to do. And that's a hard one. That's a hard, hard, hard one oftentimes because we get programmed that we have to do, do, do. Now, I'm not saying that you don't that you don't do anything. And this person is specifically saying, you know, they're taking inspired action. So they are taking action. But it goes back to that, I guess, what I started out with, which is, you know, sometimes we just feel like we want it now. We want it manifested now. And when it doesn't manifest now and we start to see the disparity that's when, oh, my magic wand is broken or, you know, these thoughts come in and that's where you have to just go back and not allow that vibration to enter into the equation and get into the now of drinking that matcha tea or observing that beautiful flower. All right. Let me know in the chat if there's uh, something more you'd like to hear on that question. Okay. Question number five, can one really get along and be your, and be friends with your partner's ex? Ooh, I, I love this one. Of course, of course you can. Um, I think there's some discernment that needs to come in here because um, there's so many variables to this. You know, there's a variable about what is the relationship that your current partner has with their ex? Um, you know, what is that dynamic? How toxic is it? If it's a really toxic dynamic, I think then you want to just have a lot of discernment around how and what you share, how much time you share with them, what you share with them, right? Because there may be some fishing going on from the ex. I'm not saying that's the case in this situation, but I'm just saying in general, um, you know, you might want to have some niceties, but also just have that discernment for some distance in, in time spent and conversations that you're having. Now, if you know that your partner and their ex is in a very good relationship and that they've had somewhat of a, let's just say, conscious uncoupling or that they are in you know, good talking terms, um, I think that gives a lot of liberty uh, for, for a great relationship um, with, the, with your partner's ex. 
And I think the more you can do that, especially if they have shared family. So if your partner has children with their ex, um, this just builds an incredible family dynamic for you and also for the children, whether they're young or they're adults. Um, when when children can see their parents, and again, I think this, this crosses all ages, when they can see their parents in a nice relationship with exes, it really it teaches them so much more than probably what what a child learns when parents stay together and don't get a divorce. So there is something really, really beautiful, I think, that comes out of divorce situations when the, the two people can have that more conscious uncoupling where they can just really understand the dynamics of their relationship that they weren't interested in pursuing any further. Maybe it's the lessons they weren't ready to learn or willing to learn um, and that they were ready to step into a new partnership. So I think uh, you should absolutely um, do everything you can to have relationships with ex um, exes, uh, your partner's ex. But I also think that it's just communication and it's also communication with your partner because there could come a time when you and the uh, your partner's ex actually build a, a really strong relationship or or just a really nice friendship. And sometimes that can feel very violating for your partner. So I think it's bringing in that sensitivity of, hmm, okay, honey, I've been invited by your ex to do this. Uh, how comfortable are you with that, right? And just giving them the option to 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 really say, oh, okay, yeah, I feel good about that. Or no, I don't feel good about that. And when they say no, that you don't trigger immediately. And, and I don't mean you, the person asking the question, I just mean in general, that we don't trigger um, with that, but that we help our partners dig deeper. Oh, I, I see that, 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 you know, my relationship now is creating an interesting dynamic for you. Um, how are you feeling about that? Like, what is, what is that? What's in there? What's, what's that, that nugget, you know, that, that wants to come out and release. And I think you'll be really surprised that you may be um, an incredible, I don't want to say mediator, but like an incredible person to help um, dissolve some of these old relationship wounds that perhaps the two individuals weren't able to uncover when they were together with each other. I'm not saying it's your job. Don't take it for sure. Do not take it on as your job. I'm just saying that sometimes as really high vibrational people, we get these incredible opportunities to help other people just blow up old partnership shit. And so if that's what you get to do, um, you know, all the better, but again, use your discernment because energetically it can get a little wonky and, and, you know, it can trigger things for you too. And so when it does just really, Think about that with yourself, journal about that, talk to your partner about that so that you don't hold like that, those ideas in your mind, because chances are your mind will make up something that is so not um, what the situation was, right? So if there's discrepancies or, you know, the ex says something about your partner that makes you feel like, oh, I didn't know that or whatever it is, make sure that you don't just shove it down, that you actually address it with yourself first and foremost. Why is that triggering me? And then talking it through with your partner if necessary, because that will allow that to bubble up and to release. And that's such a beautiful thing when it does. So, and I just energetically feel like the individual that answered or asked this question that, that that could be just a really, really fun experience to have and that you're someone that can can actually transmute this, whatever this is, whatever the, the things are that are called forward. Okay, let's go to the next question. Um, how does one manage relationships with narcissists and effectively set boundaries in general? And then there's a second part of this question about how do we set ourselves up for success in knowing when and how to set boundaries without falling into patterns. I think it has some similarities, but it was all from the same person. So I'm going to kind of keep it in the two separate sections. How does one manage relationships with narcissists and effectively set boundaries in general? First of all, at all costs, if you know someone's a narcissist, um, I would do you know everything within reason for you to spend very little time with this person, if not no time. Now it depends if it's a family member or someone that, you know, you're, you're not able to really just, uh, 
you know, remove from your life, then, then yes, this is a really relevant question because narcissists just have a way of sucking, especially the empaths in. And it's, it's a big thing right now that narcissists and empaths are in this circular torture chamber um, because the empath always wants to help and the narcissist always wants to take and doesn't want to do their own work to bring their own light through. And the empath spiritual, um, more enlightened person is bringing the light through and then just giving the light away. Now, we always want to share our light, but when we give our light and we don't get replenished in relationships, this is the critical point. I'm not saying don't share your light, but I'm saying when we give our light away and we then become very you know, the word weak comes to mind, but I don't mean it in the truest sense, but I mean it in the sense that we get drained. We get drained of our own energy and we have that spiritual toolbox. So we know how to just like keep, you know, getting through it and like bringing it through, bringing the light through, raising our vibration, raising our vibration. But if someone's constantly lowering your vibration, then your time is spent trying to do the yo-yo of the up and down, right? And, and instead of doing what your real passion and calling here is to shine the light brighter and to ascend to even greater levels of vibration. So do everything you can to move away from narcissists because there isn't, um, there isn't, well, there's always something to learn, but there isn't a whole lot more for you to probably learn in this dynamic other than to be able to, in, in a very positive way, walk away, right? So the next question about setting boundaries, you know, how do we set ourselves up for success and knowing when and how to set boundaries without falling into patterns? Um, well, the first part I think that's really great is that you're identifying that there is a pattern here. Um, it's probably not your first narcissist and it maybe won't be your last, although I hope it, I hope it can be. Um, I think that you want to start looking at the people in your life and you want to start looking at who are the people that raise my vibration. When I go and I talk to this person, I feel this way, acknowledging that, oh, I feel that way. I feel great. I feel, I feel light. I feel heard. I feel seen. And then saying, I want to spend more time with these types of people, whether it's that person in particular or meeting more of those types of people, right? So you're starting to proactively fill your calendar with these high vibe people, as opposed to the narcissist, because I guarantee you, if you don't have, you know, your own, I don't like the word control, but the, if you don't have your own um, stake in the ground about your schedule, your time, the narcissist is always going to come in and always going to yank you into their direction. Right. So if you don't have other things scheduled, and even if it's just that you say, I am going to spend you know, one night uh, a week with meditation, or, you know, this is my meditation night, then you have that. And then you know that you're doing that. So if you don't have someone else, it's not about just filling your calendar to avoid a narcissist. Of course not. It's that you're wanting to fill your calendar with the things that fill your cup, that, that really raise your vibration as opposed to, to lower it. So having this awareness that, that you have to even ask this question is, is an incredible first step, because a lot of people don't actually realize because they're so empathic and they just want to help that, that they're being sucked by narcissists. So, um, and also I think recognizing, you know, I, sometimes I feel like narcissists get a bad rap and, and rightly so in so many ways, but let's remember that hurt people hurt others. And so that narcissist has some trauma, some wound that is creating this type of personality that is you know, a little bit more of a, a sucker, right? And, and a manipulator and, and, uh, and very much about me, me, me. And so it is not your job to heal them, but it is always your job to heal yourself and for you to be in your wholeness and for you to be shining your light. And so that's, I guess, the main message about narcissists is we can still find a way to love them but love them from afar, meaning that we're going to hold our container and our energy system and we're going to let them do theirs. And we're not going to have them come in and shoot and poke holes into ours because they're grabbing and pulling and, you know, guilting and, and whatever. And whatever, what, there's another really important point. Whatever the emotion is that you are feeling from someone who you think is a narcissist, 
guilt, shame, whatever it is, um, that is your lesson. So sometimes I feel like people want to blame narcissists when eh, you call them in for a particular lesson. So let's not, you know, let's not shove the blame and say, oh, narcissists are bad and empaths are good, right? We're all here. We're all, we're all here learning our lessons. So let them do their lessons and you do yours and figure out what, why is it that I'm letting this person pull me around or manipulate me or, you know, whatever that feeling is. So, so get deep into that juicy bit so that you can heal yourself and not worry about healing others. Cause you do that when you shine your light and show your way. Okay. Next question. Um, with the, okay. This one, I think I've answered recently, but I'll answer it again. Um, different person with the holidays coming up. How can I set myself up for success in family pattern dynamics for a good holiday? Um, first of all, figure out what you want. What is it that you want? That's going to make you happy. And I mean that from a, a selfish place of self love, right? Figure out what you want. Now it doesn't mean that, you know, you're going to get what you want come hell or high water because that energy is not going to get you anywhere. It's going to get you, you know, in the same predicaments you've been in every holiday um, with all the differences you have with all the dynamics and the players and the whatever. Um, but figure out what you want and figure out what your negotiables are and your non-negotiables are. And then get really clear with your loved ones and your, and your if you have your family, your, you know, maybe your husband or wife or your children, and then go to them and say, well, what, are, what are some of the things that are really important for you this holiday? What are the things that you want to experience? And take into account what they want. So then your nucleus has an idea of, huh, okay, well, this is, you may find out that there's things that your children or your husband have been doing for years that they actually don't want to be doing. And they're only doing it because they think you want them to do it and that it makes you happy. So figure out first, what do I want? Go to the intimate people in your, in your intimate, intimate family, ask them what they want, children, husbands, spouses, lovers, you know, whoever that person is. And then, and then take that to the bigger family group, right? And, and if they're completely resistant to having any input from you as to what you want and need for the holidays, then that's where the rubber hits the road and the conversations get a little bit deeper, a little bit juicier because um, oftentimes others don't want you to challenge, you know, their traditions or the family traditions that have been happening for 25 years. And so of course, take into account what their feelings are as well. It's not coming to it as a battle. This is what we want. And you're going to have that. And we're not going to have that. And no, 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 none of that stuff. It's like, where you are really coming in from a heart centered place? And you're clear about what is really, really important for you for this holiday season and the aspects that are really important and the things that you can just let go of, like use the holidays as this incredible practice of letting go. It's like, who knows? I mean, maybe your thing is pumpkin pie and someone else's is apple. And you're like, I don't see how we can have a Thanksgiving without pumpkin pie. And the other person's like, but we always have had apple. You know, it's like, I know it's a really silly, silly example, but you know, finding that mid ground of like, well, geez, maybe, maybe you can have both, which is probably what most people do. Um, but maybe it's letting go of the idea that it has to be one or the other, or it has to be both. Maybe it's that you, the pumpkin pie lover, actually go taste the apple pie this year, right? You expand, you expand your ideas about the holidays. You, you have, you know, turkey instead of ham or what, whatever it is, right? That you have a new recipe, um, that you have a, yeah, just an opening to, to whatever the resistance is. So again, it's always going to be about you. It's less about them, but they're key players because they're family, they're friends, they're the people that you spend the holidays with. So just dig in there and figure out like, what is it um, that I want and how can I navigate what my immediate family wants and needs um, to be happy. And if, if you need to do something different, then that's also a conversation that come, can come about. But the holidays are a great time. Uh, I always uh, say there's an old phrase about, if you want to know how enlightened you really are, uh, go spend some time with your family. And then I would say, if you really want to know, spend some time with your family over the holidays, right? Because that's a place where everybody has an idea about how things are supposed to go and what we're supposed to do. And so that's going to challenge your ability to let go. 
and to to be happy in in the moment and to cherish the people that you're with because we never know if we're going to have another holiday with any of any of the people that we're with so um really staying in that moment of now all right let's go to the next question how do i figure out where i'm supposed to be i've been following breadcrumbs and intuition it makes it takes me on a wonderful adventure and I have a sense that I that I am meant for something bigger. But what am I supposed to be doing or what is my purpose? Well, again, of course, you know that only you know what your purpose is. Um, and that's the beauty, I think, of life and our soul contracts is that I think everyone thinks like, oh, I'm supposed to know my purpose, right? And sometimes for some, it's just your whole purpose is exploring yourself and expanding and raising your vibration and and helping others see different ways of being, right? That you're breaking the norm. Now, I have a feeling that this is also probably about money and like my purpose of like, how am I supposed to exist in a third dimensional reality? Um, and how am I supposed to pay my bills in this third dimensional reality? And that I think comes down to continuing to do what you love but also asking for help. And I actually don't like that word help. So I'm, I find it fascinating that I just used it, but that's what comes to me is the word help. And I don't mean it from a, um, from a place of distress. I mean it from a place of collaboration, right? So uh, I think in today's world, we've been taught at least in the last five years that with social media and everything that's just been on like steroids, that everybody, and I fall and pray to this myself, you know, everybody needs to have their personal brand and everybody needs to do, you know, their thing and their calling. And I think what it's done is it's created some, some really great things, no doubt, but also created some separation and it's created some anxiety for people because not everybody needs to have like their own personal website doing their own personal thing. I think this is where the collaboration component comes in. And this is where in community, you know, maybe it's finding that community, which I know can be challenging. It can be challenging to find a community that fits sort of with all of you and, and your, your offerings. But um, in the collective, we can do so much more together, right? It, we can do so much more in getting the word out, spreading the word, but even if we're coming down to events and, and activities and, you know, whether it's healing sessions or readings or whatever it is that we do, when we're part of a, a conglomerate that we can really move into a place of, of expansion much quicker. Again, not that time is, is the, the point, but, but there is an element, of course, of time in this third dimensional reality. And so it's really stepping into um, further into what you're already doing, right? And trusting that what you are doing is building all the tools and, and accentuating the tools that you already have to that place of culmination of which you set forth in your soul contract that you want it to be in this lifetime. So I think it's releasing these ideas of time, releasing these ideas of scarcity that, you know, that we're going to run out of time. We're going to run out of money. Um, you know, these are like serious mental constructs that are out there in, in the world. It's not, you know, it, you can't dodge them very easily. Um, and so I think it's just staying the course and finding all the ways you can to be in your heart center about it, not your mind, right? And look, the mind is a good thing. The mind, we need the mind. We just need our soul to be driving and not the mind to be driving. And I feel like that is like the part um, as we ascend and we really break through the veil and we really break through on, on some of our, you know, like purpose, like what we came to this lifetime to do. And so staying the course, staying in trust, um, staying in gratitude. I know these are all things that you already know, um, but practicing them, especially when the times come, when the mind wants to, to make a judgment that you're not living your purpose. Well, you are, right? We just don't always know like how everything fits together. And there's so many things I've done in my life where I'm like, oh my gosh, like, why did that happen? And then later on you, you realize, oh, I see how that fit together. 
Oh, right. And again, it's the mind still trying to figure that out. We never actually have to figure out if anything fits together. It's always about this moment right now. How do I feel? How do I want to feel? And how, how am I going to continue to navigate and shift my state? And sometimes we can't shift our state because we're supposed to be in that state to actually, you know, bubble up and release. So if you're feeling that frustration right now about purpose, loving what you're doing, but frustrated that it doesn't feel like it's clear, um, just keep transmuting that frustration. Just keep asking, show me, show me, show me, right? And remembering that you're not doing it alone. This is not you doing this. This is you, your higher self, your guides, um, lots of other characters here in this dimension that are here to help you. You've called them in, you've asked them to help you, but then listening for their help and assistance, asking for their help and assistance. Um, and again, I don't mean the word help in a, in a distressed way. I mean it in a collaborative community type way. So it just feels like community is, is community and collaboration is like the, the answer or the theme that's coming through with, with this particular question. All right, let's go on to the next question. Okay. Do you think anyone can read tarot cards or do people have to be psychic? Ooh, I love this because, uh, I, you know, I describe my experience with tarot cards in my my book, Angels, Herpes, and Psychedelics. I don't have a copy right here, but uh, I was always really against them because I was like, oh, there's like Ouija board, whatever. And I definitely didn't think I was ever going to read them, right? I was never going to do it myself. Um, and, you know, that was what, 20, 30 years ago now. And I do believe that we can all read tarot cards, of course. However, I will say that um, not to discount the, the skill set, the toolbox that a lot of readers have developed over the years. And what they've developed is a relationship, you know, with the cards, but not really so much the card itself, but what is on the card. So each card has an imprint. It has a graphic. It has a word or two. And, and a number, and it has elements, all, you know, the, the artwork on these cards have a vibrational essence and imprint to them. And so readers who are experienced, and maybe he would say they're more psychic, it's because they've practiced with these energies that come through the cards, right? So the cards are energy, the cards are guides. Um, and a reader, as they, the more and more they read, they're able to build this relationship with all the different archetypes on the cards, the different meanings on the cards. And then they can easily just like, oh, okay. All right. They just, you know, they get the downloads from the cards. They get the downloads from you, your aura, your essence, your question that you're asking. And they're able to just like put it all together quite quickly. And that's a talent, right? That's a skill that they've built over time. So I, I don't want to discount that a talented psychic tarot card reader is leaps and bounds ahead of really getting the energies and tuning in. But I do believe that anyone can do this. It's just a matter of how much time, effort do you want to put into it? And is that really your purpose? Because it might not be your purpose here on earth, but doing it uh, for yourself and maybe friends and family uh, might be helpful for you to practice getting in touch with your own guides, right? Getting in touch. Like I love using cards. I love tarot cards now. Um, as I said, I would have never expected that, you know, from years ago, I would have been like, no way. It's like a Ouija board, but, um, but it's not, it's, uh, it's, well, it is, but it's not, it's, it's your intention of which you have coming into these readings and the energies and spirits and the spirit realms that you want to work with. So I would highly encourage if you have any curiosity, uh, buy a deck, um, just start working with them. Um, I'm sure there's lots of trainings. I don't know of any off the top, but uh, I think the training, the best training oftentimes is the one with just you and source spirit uh, really just working with cards, asking the questions for yourself and others. So Hopefully that's helpful. I love tarot cards though. I love angel cards. I love all these different types of cards because it does bring in an energy and a vibration that gives you information from other realms and who doesn't want a little extra insight. All right, let's see here. 
Uh, we're coming down to the end here. Um, I'm wondering if I've missed my life calling. Is that possible? And can it pass us by? Um, yeah, I do think it can pass us by. Yeah, I think we can miss our calling. Yeah, I think we can, you know, we can uh, jump out of a lifetime early. We can, you know, we can die when we're 100 and feel like we didn't, you know, reach our calling. Um, I would be less focused on, on, the, on the concept of missing it and more focused on what is it that I want to do right now that might catapult me into all of the elements that I've been cultivating over all this time. So what is it that, that, um, you know, that I, that I've, that burning fire in my heart or in my belly that, that I haven't really taken action on, um, getting really real with yourself and spending more time with that energy than with the energy of, have I missed something? Um, I do think you can miss it. I think that it's more important to get the, the lessons that you learned along the way. And as I just said, to stay in the, the real energy of what can I do right now? What can I do right now to expand myself and my contribution to humanity and to my family and to my community um, at hand? So, yeah, I think the, the nudge there is um, just to really tune in tap in, tune in, turn on and, and ask for some guidance and be open for what comes. Cause a lot of times we ask for guidance, but then we don't actually receive in our hearts, the guidance, because it doesn't come in a way that we think it doesn't come in the person that we think it doesn't come in whatever. So just be really open to like the little, little nuances, the, uh, the comments that people make, the, you know, don't get caught up in the details of it, but the nuances of the energy, the essence of it. Ooh, was there a pearl there for me? Or, ooh, that tweaked me. Or, oh, I didn't like that person. Well, why? Why did you not like that person? Because it's an element, an aspect of yourself being reflected through someone else. Just get in there, figure it out. You know, what? what is what is that part of me that I don't want to see? And uh, And keep moving through it, right? Keep moving through it. All right, because um, I love to see everyone feel in purpose and in their calling and in this process for sure. And right now on planet Earth, it's a, a really integral process for many light workers to stay the course because it's been a, a, a tough a tough road. But we're breaking through the you know the third dimensional constructs are crumbling at different levels and at different times, and uh, people are seeing this differently based on where they are and their own realm of vibration. So uh, keep rising, surround yourself with other beautiful high vibe people that can help you in your community and collaboration. And just remember that we're all in this together. So I hope that helps. If there's any other questions that you might have, I would love if you put them in the comments. Um, please hit subscribe. Uh, ring the bell. You'll get notifications when, when I'm on live next, but every Sunday, 11, 11 Pacific time. I can't wait to hear from you and answer some of these big life questions together as we transform our relationships to love and to life.